kind of that mentality he has about sitting down and working on projects and getting things done. So I think this idea of Tim giving a talk on how do you, where does creativity come from and feeding creativity and building things, I couldn't imagine a better person to sort of uh, uh, have a lecture from today. And so uh, again, I'm, I, I'll just tell you a couple more things about Tim, where he is now. So. We started Backyard Brains uh, together while we were in grad school. Uh, and then in uh, 2012, we all moved down to Chile for a startup, um, a startup Chile program that was down there. And then 2019, Tim moved from Chile over to Seoul, Korea, where he started the Korean Startup Grand Challenge program and is now living in Seoul, Korea. But it is a pleasure that he came back to Ann Arbor this summer to help us with our projects. And so with that, I'm gonna pass the microphone over to Tim uh, and he's going to uh, give us a, a wonderful talk uh, for our Tiny ML Fellowship. So thank you, Tim. All right, you're muted. <laughs> All right, thank you for that lovely introduction, uh, Greg. We, uh, you, you're being too humble saying that you, I'm a better engineer than you are. We've uh, invented many uh, great things together, which... Uh, um, we'll discuss during this this talk on, on creativity. So uh, we yesterday, Stefana Stefana uh, sent out a survey, a very a very uh, complicated survey that I designed and I spent months thinking about. So the uh, the survey question was, when are you most creative? When do you feel that your brain uh, is the most open to generating new ideas? And we had thirty one people respond, and I, I we classed those responses to about thirty nine different responses. So about 10% of the responses were silence. Just want to be quiet and then my mind can enter the flow. Okay. Um, uh, oddly enough, uh, 26 of the responses were ideas come from having discussions with people, uh, making jokes and letting the conversation go wherever it wants to. Um, a lot of responses were also in the morning with a cup of coffee. This certainly applies to me as well. And then a lot of you, 18% of the responses were exercise, so that when, you, when you're when you moving your body, just letting your mind kind of uh, zone out in the pleasure of, uh, of uh, heart, your heart rate accelerating and, you know, ideas just come to your head. Um, oddly enough, I thought we'd get a lot of these, uh, but only a few said uh, solid blocks of time. Uh, I just need five or six hours to really enter the flow. I mean, a lot of us have solid blocks of time at work, but no, but no one seemed to say I need that. Uh, very few. Uh, another very common response was in the shower, washing dishes, falling asleep, or general mind space out methods. And um, this is uh, Greg and I were talking about this. And often, maybe there's something about neural networks that you, they, they fall into this valley when we just let the network enter its synchronous mode. And my favorite response, which wasn't me, and I intentionally made the survey anonymous, was pressure. We had one response that I'm creative when I have to be, which I don't really feel like. <laughs> you know, I don't know who that person is. You, creative now. Yes, sir. All right. So, um, so if we, uh, we can group these into kind of uh, the start of the day. So silence, morning, coffee. So we can say that 31% feel that uh, that's when they're, when they're creative. And that certainly applies to me. Um, talking to people, conversation. So uh, as we'll talk about in this, in this uh, presentation, a lot of the weird ideas uh, that have led to inventions of just through, through random conversations with Greg and we just let the, our minds go where they go and, uh, and inventions that we ship around the world end up resulting. And then I think um, we, can, we can classify exercise into that kind of just zone out sort of uh, uh, state. So this is almost uh, not more than 90% of the data or 90% of the data exactly is silence, morning coffee, talking to people and mind space out. And I think these certainly apply to me as well. These are the three things that I use when I want to be creative. Okay, so what is creativity? You can think of, think of creativity is your order kind of emerges from chaos where we have all these uh, random thoughts, you know, human be beings live relatively long lives and we have thoughts in our head all day. And sometimes uh, those thoughts are actual good thoughts that will generate good ideas that can, can become, you know, inventions that we ship around the world, our backyard brains, uh, they can become songs. If you're a songwriter, you know, um, a, a manuscript, if you're a novelist, uh, it can be a mathematical algorithm, uh, if you're a you know, mathematician. So uh, both Greg and I, and uh, most of the people I hang out with, uh, by intention, 
uh, don't really separate out uh, arts uh, and engineering and science. So it's what's called all sort of creative, uh, creative professionals where you take make something out of nothing. Whereas when in the sciences, there's something unknown, and we have to figure out a way to study that unknown to share it with the world. Or if you're an engineer, you invent some sort of machine or device that solves a problem. Or if you're an artist and you want to entertain or enlighten, so you write a novel or you write a choreography. Those are all sort of the same. The methods may be a little bit different, but they all they all deal with inspiration, production, and sharing. So one of the most important things, obviously, is to be inspired. You want to be inspired to get out of your routine and kind of build something new. And so as a biologist who secretly wants to be an engineer, who secretly wants to be a biologist, you know, I've been... One of my earliest memories, uh, you know, is when I was six years old and my parents were living on a military base in Queens, New York, Fort Totten. And I remember my mom taking me to the Natural History Museum in, uh, in Manhattan and I remember seeing this dinosaur. And I, I still remember, and I get emotional when I think about it, even to this day, you know, uh, 35 years later, is that I remember, you know, when you're six years old and even when you're an adult, you know, dinosaurs are cool, right? They're these big, monstrous lizards that well, even the Tyrannosaurus Rex is funny with its tiny little arms. But... I really didn't think dinosaurs were real. I mean, I, I knew conceptually that they were real and they a long time ago. But I, but I remember that day I just like walked in and I saw this huge Tyrannosaurus Rex in the center of the room. That's where I really fell in love with biology and wanted to study a, a world that could uh, create such uh, amazing things. And also this picture on the right is from uh, when Greg and I uh, went to Texas to arrange some meetings uh, with some, uh, a satellite launching company. Um, and we visited, you know, the... Uh, the, the Houston's uh, Launch Control Center, and you can see the um, the uh, Saturn V rocket. And then Greg and I were just walking around it, amazed at this beautiful machine. So, like the hands of men and women could create these beautiful machines, and I wanted to do something like that. And of course, as we all, the arts and the engineering and the sciences uh, are all sort of similar creative professions. We also get inspiration from you know literature. So, one of the most famous. Uh, writers in history is Shakespeare, and The Tempest is one of his most famous plays, and it deals with inspiration and the magic books of Prospero, okay? So um, I was thinking about, you know, this talk, and if you had asked me before, I would have said, well, I'm my, I'm my most creative when, you know, I'm alone, I have solid blocks of time, and I can go to the mountaintop. But then when I was actually thinking about some of the projects uh, uh, that have resulted in, I mean, a project that we've shared with the world. So something that we invented that is being replicated by people around the world. So I, I found that most of the things that I, I and people I've worked with have invented have been through conversations, like just uh, creative uh, brainstorming. So this was, uh, this was kind of like pre backyard brains. Uh, so uh, Greg and I, and a lot of our grad students friends would run a science fair every year where we would try to teach about the brain in creative ways. And this was a, uh, uh, a project I designed with Tyler Brown and Katie Weiss, uh, two uh, graduate student friends. And the, the idea just came out of nowhere. Um, Katie, on the left with the colored hair, had a, um, had a mold of a brain, uh, like just so you can make ice cream brains. And so we were at, um, we were, we were at a bar having sangria. Um, I forget the name of the place. It's a good part. I'll go there at some point. Um, near the law school. And I, and I said to Tyler and, and Katie, like, we had this ice cream brain, like we, we should do something with this ice cream brain because it's a brain. We got to teach about the brain and we can feed the kids ice cream. So it's a win-win, but we got to do something a little bit more creative. And, um, and so then we said, well, maybe we can, I think Katie or me or, or Tyler, well, maybe we can put the ice cream brain, not in a bowl, but in like a Frankenstein's head. And then Katie is a very arts and crafts person. So she said, well, we can make a paper mache Frankenstein head and put the ice cream brain. And I said, well, maybe then when the kids take out a bit of the brain, uh, we can tell the kids what part of the brain they ate, and then we can transfer the lesion to me. So if, uh, if you know, you eat the motor cortex, you have to tie my hands. If you eat the auditory cortex, we have to put headphones on. I think, and then Tyler said, Tim, that's totally stupid. Why should we transfer it to you? We should transfer it to the kids. And that was sort of the aha moment that really made it a really compelling exercise that's done year after year and has been replicated in other science fairs. So you can see it, and it all just, and it didn't start from, you know, me sitting by myself writing in my journal. Uh, it literally started with us all sitting together, being creative together, and just 
started with a, a little, literally an ice cream mold brain. And 30 minutes later, we had a, a highly successful um, interactive brain exhibit design. So that just, that just tells you. And, so, and then also, uh, uh, Greg said, we moved to, uh, to Chile in 2012, and we were the first members, and we were the first paying members of the first makerspace uh, in South America. So they're quite proud of that. It had, about, it had a run of about two or three years that were highly productive. And this is like, like I was saying before, that when people ask, how do I get into entrepreneurship? How do I get into invention? How do I get into science? As I've gotten older, um, you know, in my 20s, I would have said, oh, you got to go to the library. you got to read. Uh, that, that's certainly important. But, as, uh, but now I'm sort of realizing that we live in a society, right? And uh, interacting with people is often what generates the most ideas. So that's why I was sort of surprised, but not surprised, that a third of the most creative times when you're actually talking to people. So when we moved to, to Chile, um, we only really had cockroach experiments, but it was kind of hard to get cockroaches uh, in Chile. There's not really a culture of exotic animals that people keep as pets as like frogs and reptiles. So we had to start designing human physiology equipment. So Greg would, did, invented the, the muscle spiker box when we were down there. You know, I, I and Gr Greg and I co-invented the, the heart and brain spiker box and then uh, the muscle spiker shield. And this was all these sort of artists and uh, 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 design people that asked us to do more human-centered um, uh, physiology equipment. We just started working off, working on that and trying to impress our friends and then impress uh, the schools we were visiting. And uh, again, it, was, it came out through interaction with people. There's a lovely makerspace. Okay. And, uh, and again... If, if you find someone that you get along really well with and who is creative and a person of action, uh, don't let that person go. So uh, Greg was very, uh, very kind in, in, uh, in, my, in his introduction, but I also um, realized uh, very early on that Greg had that sort of playful uh, uh, sense of humor combined with the mind of an engineer. So he, he, he enjoyed building things with his friends. And so this is uh, somebody, it's like Superman, this is Tiburcio. Uh, we are very jealous of him. He's an Argentinian guy who built the first uh, uh, internet service in Argentina, I think in the 90, early 90s when he was in his 20s. He started the first uh, video game company in Chile and sold it to Japan for like a, a lots and lots of money. And then in, uh, this was in 2014. In 2014, he left Chile to move to San Francisco to start a company working on something called Bitcoin. So, yeah, 2014, he, was, he saw things way before any of us did. But uh, Greg and I uh, visited his office, and I had been working on a manipulator uh, out of wood, but I had just started learning how to use Google SketchUp, but I, hadn't, I didn't have access to a 3D printer. And uh, I, we went to a meeting, and I said, uh, yeah, we really need a makerspace. We really can't just work at the co-work uh, with a bunch of people on their computers like uh, at the, at the, at the uh, startup program where we really need a place where we can, you know, use these machines. Uh, you know, I'd like to start using a 3D printer. And then Tabuccio said, well, I have a 3D printer. I, you, I can print something for you. And I was like, yeah, whatever. He'll say he's help, 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 help me, but he's this busy CEO. He, he has 100 people working for him. He's a millionaire. He doesn't want to, he's, he's not, he doesn't really want to help me. And then I, so I tested him. I said, yeah, you know, I already have the STL files built. And he's like, yeah, send me the STL files. I'm like, whatever you know and so i sent him the stl files and then at one in the morning he sent me pictures of all the 3d printed parts i was like oh this dude is for real you know so um he uh for the next two weeks i would go to his office uh, every day and while he was managing his company he had his uh 3d printer just uh, on the desk and we were designing this manipulator together and it, it turned into one of our um one of uh backyard brains early hits because it was really a test case for what 3d printing can do uh, we, we, Backyard Brains won an award at Berkeley First Design and everything. So, and again, um, if I hadn't found Tiburcio and uh, Tiburcio hadn't been kind enough to help us out, this, this probably thing never would have reached the production stage. So all the people listening out there, again, um, if you find creative people that are fun to work with, you know, you know, spend as much time with them as you can, because the best thing in the world is to invent things uh, uh, with your friends and have fun doing it and share it with the world. Okay, and also a lot of our ideas came out of the Neural Engineering Lab. Uh, this is a picture taken in the mid 2000s. You can see uh, younger versions of uh, me and uh, Greg uh, somewhere in the picture. See if you can find them. And uh, the, the where we got our where we received our, our degrees was a, a very odd place. Uh, I've never been really uh, around so much talent. Uh, nearly everybody in that picture is is having a very very successful career at this moment, either in faculty or in industry or you know in startup companies and. Uh, 
we were all very competitive. I mean, we all helped each other out, but we were constantly fighting against each other with the ideas that we had or whether your project was good or not. Um, and at the time, it was very stressful, um, but uh, it really it made us better. So a little bit of competition, as long as it's done with respect, I think is, 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 is a good thing in, in kind of this large environment, you know. Um, I, I wouldn't uh, want to join a small lab with only one or two graduate students. Uh, and actually, when I started grad school, I was in a lab where I was the only grad student. It was very depressing. Again, because I don't think I really had anyone to bump ideas off of. Uh, and, uh, you know, you got you to gotta communicate with people. And that's, that's how you come up with interesting things. And so, uh, again, um, you want to you meet people that, that want to be creative and, and, and share those things. So Greg and I are now, uh, you know, uh, co-founders and good, you know working at backyard brains but the first project uh we developed uh just came out of sort of space outs you know we're always talking about how you really want to you know spend uh, a good time developing a good presentation uh and really caring about your audience and so and uh greg and i would sit through so many seminars it was just so boring and my mind would just face out but and you would try not to sleep. And because you're kind of in this formal environment where it's considered very impolite to sleep and, you know, we weren't famous enough scientists to just get up and leave the seminar room if it was a bad presentation. I'm not famous enough, but maybe in 10 years I'll get to that point where if the presentation's really bad, I'll just get up and leave. I know like the super famous scientists at UM would do that and I was always jealous. Um, but uh, so we would, we would uh, see all these uh, electrophysiology talks where uh, they, you would correlate the firing of a neuron to some random behavior. And, and maybe that neuron is important for that behavior, but you don't really know. And there's a lot of careful behavioral tests you have to do to, to verify that. And then also, again, we were in grad school in the 2000s, and this was really the, the glory days of fMRI, where you could just have a person do a normal behavioral test, shove them in an fMRI, and just show parts of the brain light, light it up and uh, lit up, and that would be a science paper. So uh, we'd sit through so many of these talks, and... And the thing is, like, Greg actually is, is, has a good sense of humor, um, is a good engineer, and, and again, what's important is action. I have, uh, I have plenty of friends in high school that were great idea people but weren't very good action people. So, uh, you know, if I would say, hey, you know, we, we sit through so many talks where people correlate the activity of neurons to rats' behaviors, I'm sure, you know, there's so many neurons in the brain, but... Um, let's uh let's let's do a study i mean a, a lot of my high school friends they, they would just kind of stop there and you know wouldn't want to actually do build, build something but greg said yeah let's do it so we took his data and we we fed i think 80 neurons into um into ed rance which is a, a, a high school or a college buddy no a work buddy a former work buddy a buddy of, of a former workplace of greg's and he fed it to this uh database he had a five thousand stocks and and we found you know you know, 10 stocks that followed the, the daily firing rates of these neurons perfectly. And then we, uh, we wrote it up and presented it at a, at a neuroscience conference with a straight face. People just thought we were full of, like, we were just charlatans. But it was an educational uh, paper because there's a very specific um, statistical correction that you have to do, which is why we saw these correlations which weren't real. And actually, we have friends that teach us statistics and actually assigned this paper as required reading. And it's sort of like, where's Waldo? Can you find a statistics error? And so that's something that we published. And what we actually was became relatively well known in our, in our, in our community for this ridiculous paper. And then uh, also, uh, we did another paper on, uh, you know, the perils of uh, over-correlation and imaging data. So again, find, find creative people that you enjoy working with. And also sometimes just spacing out because 30% of you said uh, the space out is where you get your ideas. And these ideas literally came, came out of just being bored out of our minds in seminars. So sometimes I miss going to boring seminars. I don't really go to boring seminars anymore uh, because we're, we're not really at a university. Sometimes I'll get up from my chair and go to a university and see a talk, but it's not that common. I kind of miss that because uh, there's a famous uh, pendulum motion of Galileo Galilei, Galilei and uh, he discovered this like equal period of a uh, pendulum. Uh, maybe this this is not true, but my physics high school teacher said he discovered it while he was in that Catholic mass. And he was watching the, sh the chandelier of candles above him sway, and it would sway with different amplitudes. And he would time the periods by putting his finger on his neck and using his pulse as a clock. So I should verify whether that's true or not. That's just even Galileo Galilei, if it's true was very productive due to a space out. So encourage that space out. And also I'm not saying that 
you know, you get your creative um, uh, passions um, solely from adults. Uh, again, when Greg and I started Backyard Brains, it was uh, we were just excited to get spikes on a laptop because we were using these powerful desktop computers and these powerful rigs of amplifiers. And uh, we were just so stoked with our early prototypes that uh, we could have a laptop in our arms and an amplifier in our hands. And we were at a sci like a outreach science fair and on North Camps at UM, and uh, there was a kid that was maybe 14 years old. It wasn't these kids. I couldn't. We never took a picture with him. Unfortunately, we should have. Um, and so I showed him the cockroach leg and you know a, like a primitive software on our laptop. And I said, "These are neurons. This is happening in your brain right now." And uh, he's like, "Cool." And I said, "Well, you know, we're developing this idea. Like, how do you think it could be improved?" And the guy smirked and he said, "It would be so much better if I got out of my phone." And the minute he said that, I was like, that is so, that is such a good idea. The iPhone had just come out, but I was, I was already too old to think that that'd be cool. I was, I was excited just to have it on a laptop, but really getting those spikes on the phone were really, really got people's attention because the neuroscience industry was used to these big racks of equipment and these big, powerful desktop computers. And when we'd go to neuroscience, people's jaws would drop and we'd plug in our iPhones and our little Walkman shaped amplifier and you could see spikes. And that really got the, our early success with our first few grants. And even to this day, it never really gets old, you know, 12 years later after our first successful demo. So that feedback came from a child or a teenager. And, that, that, that. and again, this is uh, one of my uh, best friends in uh, Chile. Uh, this is Matias Gutierrez. I want to be like him when I grow up. Very successful entrepreneur. Um, when COVID broke out, he, he is a physiology a molecular biology edu uh, education company is sort of like the molecular biology if, of backyard brains. Um, but when COVID broke out, he pivoted his company to become uh, to build a COVID screening test. And in the early days of the outbreak, his company was the number one provider of COVID tests for all of Chile. Like, you know, some people are entrepreneurs, and you know, some people are real entrepreneurs. But um, he was running a science camp uh, for Chilean high school kids, and we had one of our more famous inventions, the Robo Roach, uh, where you could control a roach for a cockroach for a couple minutes with your cell phone. And he said, "Tim, I love that you're in Greg's Robo Roach, but you know, you're not, I know you're giving a talk at that uh, that science camp next week, but um, you know, you really don't want the Robo Roach. But can you do the Robo Roach but on humans? Is there a way that you can control the activity of another human?" And I said, "Well, let, let me think about that." And, you know, um, uh, Greg had been working on a, on, a sh on, a, on a shield for the Arduino and I had a couple prototypes of that. And then she started fooling around and we got a working prototype. And that's literally one of our most popular inventions uh, was not due, again, to, you know, Greg or me just, you know, sitting on our, uh, you know, at, at our desk writing in our journal. It was literally, you know, having a conversation with a friend saying, wouldn't it be cool if? And lots of people will, sell, will say, wouldn't it be cool if? But it's the special people that tend to say, yes, let's do it. And so uh, we built the functional prototype, and, you know, uh, it, that really uh, was an important invention for, uh, for Backyard Brains. And then um, sort of a, a side project of Backyard Brains. It's not one of our, our main focuses, but we do have a few papers on microscopy. And, I, you know, electronics uh, has, has dropped in cost so much that... Um, that you know, backyard brains could be founded as a company because we could build these kind of uh, low-cost electronics to do uh, low-channel count electrophysiology. Um, but I always sort of wanted to do the same with microscopy. But you know, you can't really work with glass. Uh, you can't really. It's hard to buy. Uh, you know, if you gave me a, a budget of a thousand dollars, I could build you an electronics prototyping laboratory. You know, so a voltmeter, a library of resistors and capacitors. Um, some proto boards, and I could you could go, you could start a company, an electronics company, with a thousand dollar seed money if you if you knew what you were doing. Uh, with with optics, you can't you you can't really even buy that much uh, that many lenses for a thousand dollars. So um, a colleague I met in Chile, uh, Daniela Flores, we were thinking like, well, maybe we can build really small microscopes by making ball lenses. And so uh, we were working together, um, and we just published a paper on it uh, in March. And it was exciting um, that I, here is our, our first working image. Our first, that it, it's distorted, but those are uh, neurons, uh, uh, motor, motor uh, neuron, pyramidal cells of the cerebral cortex of a rat viewed through a ball lens that we built ourselves. So again, and it, it was just a, a fun side project. And now it's a, a paper, and we've, we've already started receiving inquiries. I just received an email 
uh, this morning from a scientist in Spain saying, hey, I actually own one of the 12 surviving Leeuwenhoek Hook microscopes. And I read your paper and it was really good. Congratulations. So that obviously made us feel good. So yeah, making fun things with your friends and sharing it with the world. It's all... Most of, you know, I've, I've spent, you know, a third to a half of this talk, you know, talking about inspiration. Inspiration is important, but also, again, it, creativity is also about creation. Like, you have the inspiration, then you have to form that inspired idea into something. So, these are two uh, bio biologist philosophers that we look up to. Uh, Maturana passed away just uh, two weeks ago. Uh, he was a senior kind of uh, scientific statesman of Chile, and he actually worked with some of the leading uh artificial intelligence uh, pioneers, McCullough and Pitts in 1959 at MIT. So he uh, did these famous experiments on frogs where you could have a frog starve to death surrounded by flies because they discovered it's really the movement of the fly that actually makes the frog see the fly and eat it. But if there's a bunch of flies just dead around it, it won't see it and it'll die. So anyway, so... He wrote books on, uh, he wrote a very famous uh, biological, philosoph biological philosophy book in the 70s called Of Machines and Living Things. So sometimes I've talked about what is life and what is an animal. It all comes from the, these books. And so they invented a word called autopoiesis, autopoiesis, which means self-production. So a, he's talking about life and cells. So a cell is its own autonomous thing with me metabolic cycles inside of itself, a, a system of routine that is capable of reproducing and capable of producing. So it's a, a routine production. And I kind of think of creativity as the same thing. And they, inv they invented this term inspired by, um, of course, uh, you, you know this, uh, this is uh, Pablo Picasso's uh, famous uh, portrait of, uh, of um, Pancho Sanchez and Don Quixote. And, if you have a chance to read Don Quixote, you are just selections of it. I've only, I've only read a few chapters of it, you know, the famous chapters. It's really funny because it's a 50-year-old uh, or 60-year-old man who's obsessed with chivalry and, and, and knights. And he spends all day reading books about, you know, 1300s knights. And then he gets fed up with himself reading so much and he decides to become a man of action and actually become a knight himself. So the debate of Don Quixote is devote yourself to letters to reading and literature to absorbing information or to action you know and, and producing so that's always the dilemma and creativity you know you need you need some time to let the ideas develop you need to have some sort of cultural education and scientific education uh to come up with ideas but at some point you have to become a person of action and build on those ideas you know if uh you know, uh, if you read a lot, reading a lot is great, but if you're not producing by writing on your own or using that knowledge to invent, you just, it's just a hobby. It's nothing more than that. You shouldn't overly celebrate it. And so, so for me personally, and I think for everyone, we always struggle in, in creative work uh, between routine and entering the unknown. So, you know, you all know that we actually, Greg and I, and many of our colleagues actually spend very, very little of our actual day-to-day -day actually doing invention and doing experiments. And when we can, it's actually quite a pleasure. And there's a running joke is that it's easier to spend eight hours in front of your computer than 15 minutes at your lab bench. That lab bench. And I find that totally true, uh, especially in the entrepreneurship world. You see people sitting all day for eight hours on their computer and often think, well, you say you're a startup. Shouldn't you be engaging with customers and working on your prototype. So, but it's just very easy to sit at your computer and write email and do things that are easy for you all day instead of doing the hard thing, which is actually enter in production. Um, and so the, I struggle with that even as a mature adult. And it is my biggest thing is uh, it's the constant struggle between routine, which is a very important part of, uh, of, of being in a business, of being a scientist, and the novel, which is also a very important part of, uh, of being a, having a business and being a creative scientist. And we all find our own ways uh, to, to, to deal with this. So again, so you, as a creative person, you have to struggle with the known and the day-to-day -day things you have to do versus the unknown and the new circuits that you have to design. And, oh, man, like, how am I going to do that? And, and often uh, someone did say pressure, is what causes them to actually finally um, design their circuit. And I said, I don't, that's not true for me, but actually thinking out loud now, um, we often put off the hard design work until, oh, damn, we have a conference and uh, 
we were supposed to show off that new prototype and then the pressure actually forces us to sit down and design that circuit. So that, that has happened, it happened a couple times to me, okay? So, so we all have those issues and I can't really give you any advice uh, beyond just recognizing it, that our, our daily lives, we're always struggling between the novel and the routine and how to manage those both is something I struggle with every day. And as an engineer, Greg and I certainly know um, uh, a, that the best engineering often occurs under constraint. And Greg knows what this is. I know what this is. But um, I'm going to open the floor up. Does anybody in the audience know what this is? And Greg, can you um, uh, uh, manage the, uh, uh, the answers? Is this something on a submarine? Uh, submarine is close. It's not in water, but it is in another hostile environment. Is it in space? It's in space. All right, boys, we have two hours to build this using only this. They well, we got it. Ding, 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 ding. We got Jim Bledsoe says the Apollo 13 air filter. <laughs> yeah, very good. Yeah, so this is a great scene that uh, as an engineer, we always love um, because when the uh, service module blew up uh, or exploded, they couldn't, uh, they had to stay in the lifeboat of the lunar module and that only had the CO2 canisters for two days for two people. But there were three people and they had to use it for five days. So, but the shape of the, of the lunar module was square and the, the monist and in the command module were, um, were cylindrical. So they had two hours using only the materials uh, on the spaceship and to make a conversion kit and they were successfully able to do it. So, all right. All right, another one. Uh, Greg and I are aviation buffs. Uh, we secretly want to design spacecraft and airplanes. Um, so here's another one. Does any, everybody knows what the bottom is, but does, does anyone know what the top is? Is that a glider? No, that's, uh, there's a reason you, you don't know what the top is. That is Langley's Aerodrome. So the Wright brothers didn't come out of nowhere. I mean, there was the, it was very much the zeitgeist of the, of the era at the turn of the century. Is are human beings capable of building sustained, heavier than air uh, piloted uh, aircraft? And so the Wright brothers, you know, they had a successful bicycle shop, but they weren't wealthy. And so they kind of focused on the fundamentals of designing, uh, uh, of really understanding the aerodynamics of the gliders really well. And so then they just, uh, they, they hired a local gearhead they had to be a little creative in designing a, a low a, um, uh, a low weight engine, but it wasn't really anything advanced. Uh, just a gearhead stuff that a talented gearhead could build. But Langley, um, he built this huge, huge plane that needed a huge engine, and uh, he got he had these huge grants at the time, fifty thousand dollars from I think the Department of the Army or uh, the National Science foundation what the equivalent at the time he just burned through all this money trying to build this massive engine and he never had a successful flight and the, but the wright brothers with a, with fewer resources but thinking about it under constraint actually became famous go ohio i was born in dayton on the uh, wright patterson air force base hospital precisely because of these two uh, brothers here okay and there's a picture of the langley aerodrome at the uh, alternative uh, air and space museum okay so there's a picture of greg and me so this was, uh, the Backyard Brains was a side project, um, and uh, we were uh, graduate students that really didn't have that much money. So we, this, the idea was, could we record a spike for less than $100? Um, and so we were just, we funded it ourselves, and we worked on the side. You could see the, the stuff in the back just looks like garbage. I mean, at the time, we were really proud of it, but I look at it now, and I'm like, oh, man, what, what, a, bunch of, what a bunch of amateurs. Uh, but because we had to work under constraint, we were actually able to be very creative, and that would kind of led to the, the, the first rounds of attention and the first rounds of funding. And so another uh, popular invention was the RoboRoach. And uh, we needed a way to wirelessly remote control a cockroach. But again, we, we didn't really have that much money. Uh, we couldn't really design our own wireless chips at the time. So we actually came up with the idea of using a remote controlled toy, uh, taking the infrared circuit out of it, and then it wasn't really anything for Greg and I to develop a uh, 555 timer with some University of Michigan BME students that turned the uh, DC voltages of the, of the toy into, into, into uh, spike trains to simulate the cockroach, right? And so again, that was constraint. And it was forced constraint because this was a University of Michigan biomedical engineering project um, and we, we were only allowed to spend less than $500. So often 
um, when people give you budgets uh, in engineering competitions, not doing it because they don't want to give you money, they're doing it because they're forcing you to be creative, right? Okay, and then one constraint, you can consider COVID a constraint. So this is a, uh, a colleague of ours who teaches at a very posh high school in Los Condes, Chile, um, an international school, uh, Ryan White, and uh, we had a Zoom meeting to work on some things uh, uh, last year, and he said, hey, you know, with the pandemic, we're doing remote teaching, and, you know, uh, your human-human interface is that Backyard Brains makes is one of the, you know, kids just love that, but, you know, kids can't move, can't work together, you know, is there any way you can make a human-human interface over the internet? And, you know, so the, well, that's actually a really good idea, and Greg and I had thought about it, but we never actually spent any engineering time trying to solve the problem, but it was the COVID pandemic that made us finally uh, sit down uh, and try to design something. And so we developed a minimal, but minimum viable product uh, using uh, some Adafruit uh, servers and um, and uh, and uh, the Arduino wireless. And as of this morning, uh, for now we're just testing it in the market in Korea. And as of this morning, we got the purchase order, and the first twenty units have been sold. So that's kind of exciting. All right. And so uh, also uh, engineering under constraint. Uh, there's a famous story in Backyard Bates history where we were working with a colleague uh, to measure the visual system of, uh, of uh, grasshoppers. And this person was really struggling trying to build a, an app uh, for the iPad that would show moving dots. And you know, weeks and weeks and weeks were spent trying to get this app working. And we said, well, why don't you just draw a circle on a piece of paper with a pencil and, and wave that in front of the grasshopper eye? And we did that, and sure, well, sure enough, it worked, and that was enough to get the preliminary data. And so again, uh, the, if, if we should have put that constraint that you can't use an iPad, and probably would have come up with a more with a better uh, solution. Okay. Okay. So we want to talk about pitfalls, and uh, Greg, uh, I'm trying to keep track of time, but feel free to interrupt uh, if we're going over. Um, so also, um, I personally, as an inventor. You know, Greg, Stanislav, uh, the, the whole engineering team, we always struggle with time management. And I'll say, oh, I really wanted to work on that, but, you know, I just, I'm so busy, I don't have time. Um, and often that is true, but uh, sometimes when, when I've had people working with me or, or students working with me and, and projects seem to take too long, I'll tell the students, like, hey, you know, why don't you just do a, do a time analysis? Like, just, you know, just one day next week, just every 15, put, your, put, put, put a timer on your watch and every 15 minutes, have it go off and then just write down what you were doing in the previous 15 minutes. And you don't have to share it with me. I'm, I'm not going to be some satanical boss that needs to know what you're doing on a 15 minute basis. Like, don't share it with me, but just do it yourself so you can see how you're spending your day. And I've only done this two or three times and I'm 41 years old and it's really actually quite embarrassing when you do it. And it's a, it's a helpful exercise so you really see how you're spending your day and it, it kind of opens your eyes. Um, and so actually with uh, paper writing, um, I, I sometimes keep track of time. So um, one of our papers that Backyard Brains uh, has published was on leg regrowth, you know, where we had, we were measuring the, how, how long it took for a cockroach leg to regrow. And it was like kind of a, a really uh, sloggy paper because we had to measure the length of the growing legs by hand in image J. And it was just, it was just a slog. And of course we had the business to run and schools to go to and all these kind of things. And so the paper took five years to, to finish. And, um, but actually if you do the time analysis over the five years, it was 95 hours before it was accepted with major revisions and 97 hours after it was accepted with major revisions. So it was five weeks of work, but over five years, of course, you know, five weeks is a lot of time. If I said, hey, Greg, I need you to do nothing for five weeks and just work on this invention, the invention would be awesome, right? <laughs> like, but five weeks over five years is not really that a lot of time, you know? So be careful when you say, you know, you don't have time to work on something because sometimes that's true. Maybe most of the time that's true, but that can also be a trap. And if you feel, you feel like that you're losing, that things never get done, I, I just highly recommend and don't, you don't need to share it with anybody, just do a time analysis. So, and I'll even give an example that I'm not too proud of. Um, I've been leading a, a team uh, with Greg uh, to publish the Roboroach paper. And we've been working on this Roboroach paper for 10 years. And you see, the last time I worked on it was on February 5th of this year for 20 minutes, right? And so in, in, four, in the last four and a half years, I've spent 47 hours. So if you told me, Tim, why hasn't that Roboroach paper been published yet? 
you know, you, you, you publish everything that you, you, the company always publishes anything that they invent, but not the robo roads. And it's a shame because other people have copied your robo roads and they're publishing it and they, they never reference you because you don't have a publication. I can't say, Oh, I just haven't had time because come on, you know, 47 hours in four and a half years. Like th there's a reason it's not published. It's because after 10 years, I've, I've sort of lost interest and I sort of forced myself to work on it here and then and I go on these spurts and bursts. But that's the real reason it's not published is because I just haven't made the time. It's not because I don't have time, you know, to like spend 20 minutes on it, you know, you know, uh, five times a week in 2021. So again, don't be psycho about time analysis because it'll, it'll, it will drive you crazy, but it is a helpful exercise if you're finding that your know, projects that you're working on seem to be stuck in development hell. And again, um, I, I, you know, we all work on personal side projects, but I haven't really talked about that because a lot of the personal side projects are for you, but this is more for things that you want to um, share with the world. So it's very, very important that there is a reveal. So when, it, when you're working on an idea, it's often it's secret, right? Because maybe the idea is, is very, very crude. Um, and if you reveal the idea too early, people won't take you seriously. But at some point, you have to show it off to colleagues. So this illustration on the right um, is an illustration, a Chilean illustrator did a, while, a long time ago. But when we first started working on the plant spiker box, um, when, we first, when we finally got it working, we were at Woods Hole in um, the Marine Biological Laboratory. And it was, I think, 10 o'clock at night. And there were all these professors you know, from Stanford, Harvard, MIT, all super famous, super successful. And so we got it working, and it was so exciting. And then we, we said... Uh, you know, then, uh, you know, I went into the next room and I said, hey, everybody, I know you're all busy working on your computational neuroscience software. Uh, but Greg and I just literally five minutes ago had our first success recording from a Venus flytrap. So if you want to see an action potential in a Venus flytrap, come down the hall. And then some people slowly got up and then we heard, whoa, and then more and more people got up. And then even the most famous professors who are really busy got up and everybody uh, was really fascinated. And then that, that kind of told us that maybe we had something here. And actually, it's one of our biggest sleeper products. It's, uh, it, we're, you know, Greg and I aren't really plant experts, um, but uh, we sell a plant spiker box, and it's one of the most famous inventions among our biology teachers because it's just really a fundamental thing about the universality of uh, ion conduction and impulse uh, propagation, in, including in plants. So, and it, it, you, if, if we had just done it on the side, Greg and I could have said, well, that's kind of cool but we're not really plant biologists. It's not really our wheelhouse, but by revealing it to the community, the community gave us feedback and then that, that pushed us to turn it into a product. So if you're an inventor, you can be an inventor and just keep your stuff at home. If you like to write short stories, you can just keep those short stories on your hard drive, but you're just, you're really just a hack at that point. If you really want to be a professional, you have to share it with the community. You have to, you have to. Okay. Again, like Greg and I could have built our prototype of the $100 spike and it could have just stayed, you know, in our garage. But uh, well, um, if we hadn't put it out there, we wouldn't have received the feedback uh, that we got that allowed Backyard Base to be formed. And again, um, you, know, you, always, you have to pick the right time to reveal a prototype because if it's too crude, it doesn't really work that well. Uh, people won't take you seriously. Um, and if it's too polished, you probably should have shown it off beforehand to get feedback before you went too far down the engineering rabbit hole. So, um, for example, uh, we had this very crude, s slow prototype of the wireless human-human interface, but it, it couldn't, I was using a very, uh, like a very bad server. You could only connect one device at once. It had a two second delay, but it worked, it worked. And so then, uh, 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 a, uh, one of our former backyard brains colleagues, Florencia Edwards in Chile, she, uh, I was, she was asking what were the new things we were working on. And I said, well, I had this prototype of a wireless human human interface, but it's too slow and it doesn't scale. So I can't even really distribute beta units. She's like, and she said, Oh, I, I, I know someone, uh, Alejandro, uh, who's just super smart coder. Um, I think he, he might be interested in working for you. And uh, I showed it to him, and he was just so fascinated. He said, "Oh yeah, you're using this really bad server. Let, let me let me hack at it, and I'll and uh, we can we can uh, we can we can work together on it." And I made him an offer, and uh, he built an MQTT server, and now we have a server in the backyard bank's office. And if I had just come to him and said, "Hey, I want to connect something to the internet," he might have blown me off, you know, uh, and just done the cocky coder thing. But because I had a working prototype, sure it wasn't great, but it showed that I was for real. And uh, then he wanted to work with me. And so that was with Backyard Brains being started. 
even having prototypes that didn't work that well showed that we were for real. And then people just came out of the woodwork and uh, offered to help us. So again, you got to choose the right reveal and the right reveal leads to the community helping you. So again, a lot of our inventions haven't been Greg or me or Etienne or Stanislav or Wenbo on the mountaintop uh, meditating and we come back down with this invention and it's already done. Okay. Okay. I'm almost reaching the end. I'm almost reaching the end. Um, but we often don't talk about this uh, um, in when we talk about the creative process, but um, you have to, emotions are really important in invention because emotions animate you to, to action, right? If, you, if you're just feeling blase, if you're bored, you often aren't really motivated to work on a project. And, and uh, attraction is a very strong emotion. So I'm going to keep it gender neutral. But in 2014, there was somebody at the Makerspace who I had a huge crush on. Uh, I was a graphic designer, an electronic artist. And the person came up to me and said, oh, um, uh, I know you have a prototype of a, of a heart monitor, but can it also work on the, on the brain? Um, and I said, I would have said, uh, uh, I, I'm a, I have a PhD in neuroscience. I've been to so many seminars on EEG, and I'm sorry, but I've never actually seen a real EEG. I have a, I have a, a, a damn doctorate, and I've never seen an EEG. So I doubt, you know, uh, our equipment will work. There's no way it could work. But I didn't say that, right? Because I wanted to impress this person because I was attracted to that person. So I worked a little bit harder than I would have normally. Um, and we met at the makerspace, I think two days later, and there was a guy who didn't have any hair, who was a uh, shaven, uh, Jean Pierre, and we stuck uh, electrodes on the back of his head, and I asked him to open and close his eyes, and the, the data was incredibly dirty. But uh, I did some old tricks from MATLAB in grad school, and in the spectrogram, I just saw the faintest activity at 8 hertz when he closed his eyes, and I was just so excited. I, 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 I knew, I just knew we had something. And again, this invention um, was because I was attracted to somebody. So that's, I'm not ashamed of that. So just really, whatever emotion you get, you know, like ride that emotion. Um, and n nothing really resulted because that person was already in a relationship. But, uh, you know, like if that hadn't happened, like, we probably wouldn't have released the Heart and Brain Spiker Box for another few years. All right. Also, um, another emotion is rage. And I don't mean rage like you want to become violent, but kind of emotion that makes you angry, right? So again, uh, I wanted to learn about how the brain works, and uh, so did Greg, and we had to go to grad school, and so did ETM, and we had to go to grad school to use this equipment um, to get it, gain access to this equipment to see the spiking activity of neurons. And uh, I remember in the 2000s, I was really impressed by this equipment. It looked all fancy and space agey to me. But now I'm looking at it, it looks like a piece of garbage. Sorry, Harvey, your, your equipment's awesome. It's just, <laughs> um, and so, but I remember seeing this. I was just being so mad. Like, why is all this software so hard to use? Why do we need five, like, different pieces of equipment? And why is it, why do we need all these expensive electrodes? Why is it so expensive to study how the brain works? Like, I would have loved to have access to this when, you know, I was a high school student. Like, I'm you know, I'm mad that Greg's such a good coder because he was able to learn how to code when he was a teenager. I'm, I'm here in my mid-20s, almost approaching my 30s, and I'm just now learning how to interface with neurons. I'm mad, you know, and so that's sort of how the idea for Backyard Brain started. It started out of rage. Like, is it necessary that this equipment be so expensive and so hard to use? And again, like, anger is a very compelling emotion, and it's a if you're angry something is too expensive or too hard to use, you can use that anger to creatively invent something that, that ends up solving the pro problem that you had. So again, don't like just learn, you know, don't, if you're angry, don't become violent. You know, that, that, that's not healthy for society, but it's not being angry is not necessarily a bad thing. Also jealousy. Jealousy is another powerful emotion. So I remember in the 2000s, uh, Greg and I would read about these remote control insects at uh, you know, UC Berkeley and at Cornell. And I was jealous, right? Because these labs had uh, multi-million dollar DARPA grants. And, you know, it was, uh, these were prestigious electronics labs, but they had maybe two grad students, you know? So four people in the world could work on remote control insects. And I was jealous because it's just such an interesting technology, being able to you know, uh, interface with biobots and stuff like that. So then Greg and I thought, well, you know, you know, I'm sure there are other people that feel like, us. Oh, there's probably a 15-year-old kid that's reading about this on, you know, on, the, on, a, on a tech podcast or seeing it on YouTube. And 
and for the rest of our lives, it's just going to be a weird YouTube video. I mean, that, I'm jealous of the people that get to work on that stuff. So then we started saying, well, maybe we could build a cheap version. And our PI would laugh his ass off when we had working prototypes and we sold this thing for $100. He said, Tim and Craig, literally millions of Department of Defense money have been spent on this. And you're offering something that works for $100? Uh, you, you know, so he had a... Uh, Dale has kind of a good sense of humor and kind of a prankster uh, demeanor as well. So he, he, he approved. So thanks, Dale, for support. And also uh, an emotion is wonder, right? So uh, like I said, uh, we at Backyard Brains are big fans of space and aviation. Um, and I remember, um, Sam will know this, uh, this is at the McDonald Observatory uh, in West Texas. Um, nerdy road trip uh, with my uh, good, um, uh, surprisingly enough, computer engineering friends at the uh, University of Texas. I was always the biologist, you know, I've always enjoyed hanging out with engineers. Um, we went on a road trip for spring break to the telescopes and they had a star party. Um, and uh, we went to the star party and the amateurs had the really high grade amateur uh, telescopes. And you could look at the Horsehead Nebula and I peered through one and I'd never seen the rings of Saturn with my own eyes. I, I, I had seen it, you know, in books, um, and I, you know, seen it on TV. But when I put put my eyes through the uh, the telescope, and I saw this, the whole field of view was Saturn and these beautiful shimmering rings. I and mean, it was like I got speechless. He almost cried. You know, I was like, I can't believe how beautiful this thing is. Like, and what I what I love about the rings of Saturn is that you can't see it with your naked eye. You have to invent a telescope to see it. And so I, I kind of knew from that day forward that I really wanted to be involved in uh, scientific tool making. It took a while to fulfill that prophecy, but that's, there's really something so elegant about uh, developing a new tool and, and, and you know, sharing it with the community that allows people to see the world in a, a new and, uh, and uh, enlightening way. Okay, so I'm going to close out here. So uh, this is this is a... This is a, a this is a mic drop for Greg. Uh, Greg knows who's, who that person is, but does uh, anybody else uh, know who this is? Is that John Ham? That is John Ham. And what what is uh, what is the what is the personality he's playing in this uh, in this uh, photo? What was it called? I can't remember. Yeah, yeah, it's a little. Uh, I think this it ended about six or seven years ago. Um, it's a uh, Mad Men. Uh, it's about the uh, advertising uh, culture in New York and California from the late fifties to the early seventies. Very good show. Anyway, so that's just that's just that's just a, a cultural reference uh, for Sonia and Greg uh, and me. So with all of you all. Uh, I've been talking about a lot of artsy, fun, fancy, get in touch with your feeling stuff. But you all are working on very applied uh, ML uh, projects. So, what is ML good for? Okay. So, I'm going to give some examples from uh, my my struggles as a scientist. So, uh, the Backyard Brains team uh, has been chasing sleep classification for the past four years because the the data files are really long. They could be 90 minutes to to eight hours. Uh, they could be full of artifacts. Scoring is a pain in the rear. Uh, and so we have a sleep right up on our website, and it's good, but it's not great. Like, it could be great. Uh, like, we have some really great write-ups. Like, the introduction to EEG has, has received a lot of attention. And that's great. This one is just good. And the reason it's not great is because we really don't have a good classification system because it's just a pain to hand classify sleep. So if we could do an M, a tiny ML, where we could train a tiny ML on separating out stage one with the alpha wave, stage two with the K complexes and sleep spindles, stage three with uh, delta waves, and REM awake with uh, gamma and reduced alpha, that would be great. No, I, think, I think students and teachers would love that, but we just haven't been able to develop a good classifier. And so people just have to sort it by hand. And so you can see, you can see delta waves, the occasional sleep spindle, but again, it's okay, We're not great. So that's an example of a perfect uh, ML project. And then also, uh, Freddy, uh, the Sa El Salvador, uh, the savior, is resurrecting a project uh, that unfortunately we had to abandon uh, about five years ago. So we had partnered with the Chilean uh, father-son engineering team on the hacker hand, and that, that, where you could control individual fingers. But um, the control software um, just didn't really work that well. Like I really had to contract my fingers really strongly, almost so that it, that it hurt. And my classification never really was that good. And I didn't really 
we didn't really feel like we could be honest to ourselves and sell it to customers when it barely worked even for the inventors. You know, as, as Greg says, we eat our own dog food. And if I don't really like using our own invention, you know, I can't really expect our customers to. So t- because we were developing these algebraic kind of logic rules for, you know, if this channel is active, then this other channel isn't active, contract the thumb. And so you can check, these are, these are, this is actual real data. Um, so you can see that there's classification uh, of the five channels for the different finger movements, but I could never really code algebraically the classification. I'd always have to put these if, else, if, else, if, else, if, else. And this is like a, a perfect example that you can, you can do the Wizard of Oz test where you can see that the patterns of activity are indeed different for the five different finger movements. But I think a, a, a machine learning would be a much better classifier um, than the algebraic uh, um, code that Tim and the, and the and the Chilean we hired worked on. So that, this is a perfect casebook for ML. Okay, this is a video of something. What's the video of? Okay. All right. So this is um, the RoboRoach quantifier. So the RoboRoach project has sort of been in development hell for ten years. Again, it's been a criticism of backyard brains so that we've never formally published our RoboRoach experiments because tracking a RoboRoach is a pain. You know, so you can do it with like. You know, people try to measure the degrees of turning with a protractor. I developed this prototype of a floating, um, of a of a of a cockroach floating on a ball, and Stanislav helping with some code. And I'm very slowly quantifying this data. I talked about it earlier, but if we had a, a visual uh, ML processing uh, thing, or we could use deep lab cut, I think that probably would have helped out the RoboRoach be published much much faster because just doing the data analysis on all the all the implanted cockroaches just slowed the project down, and you lost your motivation, and you come up with other more interesting things to work on over time. Okay. Okay. So um, Greg uh, has been hitting home that uh, we don't necessarily have to use machine learning all the time, like. It's, it's, we don't want to just be uh, a group of scientists that are trying to follow the trends and saying, we want to work on a blockchain, augmented reality, fintech, machine learning product. You know, like, those are the followers. We don't want to be the followers. We want to be the leaders, right? We want, people to, we want to be considered those who are, gonna, who are moving the industry forward, not, not those who are trying to hop on the train. So we're very careful with the message, messages that we depict about our company. And so, for example... If we were charlatans trying to raise money, money, and we did not care about being uh, honest, we could pitch, and you know, we participate in entrepreneurship events all the time. I could get up in front of an audience and show the claw and say, "We're using machine learning to control this claw," and not a single judge would question it. They'd be like, "Ooh, body signals, ooh, robotics. Wow, these guys must be really smart." But then, if you know, if Greg and I or I were in the audience, we would raise our hands and be like. And, and, and call bullshit because if you have one degree, a one degree of freedom control server servo does not need machine learning. All you need is a simple amplitude threshold to control the server uh, servo. And so it would be honest, uh, dishonest, and fr- quite frankly, stupid um, and misleading to try to sell, you know, this, this claw and build an artificial intelligence machine learning algorithm into it just so we could drop the buzzword and sound smarter than we really are. You know, the smart thing is to use the simplest algorithm uh, that, that accomplishes what you want to do. Okay, so that's a bad example. Okay, all right. And this is a per- per- personal pet peeve of mine is that, you know, I love EEG. And one of the proudest moments of uh, my career was when I saw that EEG for the first time at the Santiago Makerspace, because I, I knew that, you know, we had, we had stumbled across an EEG algorithm and an uh, EEG prototype, and within a year, we'd have high school students around the world seeing their own brain activity, which is really emotional for me. Um, and so I really get uh, bothered um, when I see our competition, and competition is fine. You know, we, we like OpenBCI and they're our competition, but they're legit. But when we see sort of the more um, kind of uh, EEG companies that say they have their proprietary AI algorithms that process your EEG to say whether how calm you are. And that always makes my eyes roll and makes me groan because we all know how how dirty um, and noisy EEG is. And if you can't see the raw data, 
you have no idea what that artificial intelligence algorithm is doing. And moreover, hiding it and saying we have a proprietary AI algorithm. It's like, give me a break, you know? So um, it's co it should it, it should almost be regulated. I'm almost to the point it should be regulated. And it, should, it should be illegal to sell the snake oil to the unsuspecting public. And so that's an example of why I think machine learning could be abused by transforming an EEG signal and not showing the, the real EEG data, which is uh, common in our industry, unfortunately. Because, you know, we often see EEG um, video games. And my dream, I would love to see in my lifetime, I want to play Super Mario Brothers with my EEG. But we need a one-third of a second precision to control Mario's jumping to actually play the game. And the best that Greg and Stanislav and I can do with uh, EEG processing algorithms at the moment is a two-second delay. So that's how you can control the tone and you have that kind of like audio music game. But to control Mario, you need a third of a second. So that's an example of a bad of bad um, ML uh, use, right? So again, uh, in, in, during the summer, um, we are going to be using machine learning to solve problems that would otherwise be too difficult uh, and not non-ideal uh, using traditional methods uh, to, to develop, such as, you know, the, the hacker hand, uh, doing single trial classification of the free will stuff, the poker stuff of GSR. But again, we're not using machine learning just to use it and just to sound like we're sophisticated and we want to do block blockchain, fintech, augmented reality. We're using it because it's solving a problem and, in, and we want to use it because it's the simplest way to solve a problem that we have. And again, that's what the appeal of backyard brains was in the beginning, that the cockroach leg, single channel amp, and the iPhone interface was just the simplest solution to the problem of how can I show spikes to my high school students in a compelling way. So again, I'm going to close out with the uh, steel one from Steve Jobs and steel one from Steve Brandt. Uh, this is the back of the whole earth catalog, a very famous uh, tool uh, catalog uh, from the 70s. So keep, keep finding inspiration in all the ways you can, both in engineering and biology. That was awesome. Uh, do we have any questions for Tim? We're a little over, but that's all right. It was a wonderful talk. Thank you. Yeah, we're getting a lot of accolades on the uh, on the chat. Mm -hmm. And so the um, well, I'll ask you, Tim. So, have you learned anything new about AI since you started? Was since you've been working with the real signals this week? Um. Yeah, because um, I thought we could just. Um, shove our data into prepackaged um, AI softwares and then it would just work. We'd all be done in a week. But now there's all this data conditioning we have to do with uh, separating out the, uh, you know, the blinks versus non-blinks and putting them into edge impulse. And that's actually a non-trivial problem is how do you, how do you train the AI algorithm? And also I'm um, learning about Unix. <laughs> so yeah. Greg is finally forcing me to learn about Unix. So, yeah. <laughs> so data conditioning and data quality in the beginning is, is highly important for the machine learning. All right. Well, thank you so much. And I think we're going to need Tim's creativity because we're trying to take this uh, kind of complex thing. Or it's it's not just machine learning. It's also Arduino. It's also robotics. A bunch of you know uh, things that have to go into a project. Um, and we're going to make that for KF12. And so we have to figure out a, a clever way to simplify this. And uh, Tim is probably the best person in the world to do that. So anyway. Uh, thank you, Tim, for speaking today. And uh, we will uh, see you next week. Next week we have. Alyosha uh, giving a talk uh, from Apple about machine learning. So uh, we can, we'll meet you next Wednesday. All right, take care.